today we're going to continue with chapter 11 so i just on the whatsapp uh, the lecture notes for chapter 11 which uh, will be about the equilibrium Okay, let me open up the slide. So this, uh, basically this topic uh, is actually much easier compared to previous topics because it's not, not involved uh, many things to be considered in terms of uh, Actually, the relationship of the forces. Okay, so this is uh, what you will learn in this chapter. All right, so basically you need to know what is the center of gravity. Okay, and also problem solving in terms of rigid bodies in equilibrium. Okay, and then you need to know what is tension, compression, pressure, and shear. Okay, and then when the object is stretched and how much it will deform or it will break if it is at maximum deformation. Okay, so this is, uh, we have the Robin Aqueduct, okay use the principle of arc okay so the you know that the shape of the arc so like that so this is uh, like a, a bridge okay where you need to apply this in order for you to have uh, object can be moved on top of that all right Okay, so in the construction, so we are interested to make sure that the objects don't accelerate. Okay, so actually this uh, in the history, the Roman people okay, use this actually to put the water, okay? So to flow the water on top of that uh, aqueduct so that with a high volume of water, it won't break the structure. Okay, so this is uh, basically a great build because it still lasts until today, right? It still lasts until today. So even though it has been carried water for a long, long time ago, it still can because it still holds the principle of the elasti elasticity of the object. Okay, meaning that it does not deform to the maximum uh, maximum uh, deformation. Okay, so we have the condition for equilibrium. Okay, there are two conditions that must be satisfied. So first of all is the total of force must be zero, okay? And then the total of torque must also be zero. Okay, so that's the two condition for equilibrium. Okay, so let's look at uh, the example here. Okay, for example, we have this object in the static equilibrium, okay? So you, uh, you see, if you can see that, uh, the force applied over there, is the net force is zero because the force upward is equal to the force downward okay and then uh, we need to know the equilibrium uh, so the torque right the torque is uh, the multiplication of f and l right as you remember that you uh, learn from the last topic Okay, F times L. So both of that are similar, all right? 
is also f times l. So that's why, okay, so that's why you still have your top, then uh, the total top is also zero. Okay, so you know that your point, okay, uh, the point of the equilibrium is at the center of the object. Okay, so that's for the first example. Okay, so second one, okay, we are missing that 2F, right? We are missing that 2F and then the F is now it going up and then no one is going down. Still, the net force is a zero, okay? But we have now, okay, we have now the top is not more zero, okay? Because now we have a net top, okay? So which is in the clockwise direction, okay? So it's going to be rotated to that way, okay? So this is the second example. So where this is not in the equilibrium, okay? Because the top is not zero, okay? And then we look at this third example. Okay, now we have the force, okay? We have the force is um, okay, the force is not zero over here because we have the force upwards which is 3F but we don't have any force downward, okay? So the net force is 3F, okay? So over here means that the object is going to move upward, okay? The object is going to move upward. So let's say you have a coin over here, okay? Or I have, I have a, a round object over here. So I have applied the force upward so you don't have the force downward, so it won't stay equilibrium, okay? So because you have the force upward, okay? And then for the top, it is zero over here because the object is not rotating, okay? The object is not rotating. It's because of, you see that 2F times half L still give you F L, right? And also on the left side, you have F times L, right? So it is similar. So it is cancelled out because one is going counterclockwise and another one is going to be uh, clockwise. Okay, so your net torque is still zero. Okay, so you have only equilibrium on the example number one not in example number two and also not in example number three. Okay, so from there, so we know that at the center that is called the center of gravity. Okay. So center of gravity mean that the object's weight as thought is all at a single point. Okay. So that's the center of gravity. Okay, so you look at the picture there. So where we have, okay, we have, if we have the origin okay, over there, and then we have Ri, okay, we have Ri, this blue one. Okay, the gravitational talk about origin okay, of a particle of mass mi. So we have mass over here within the object. So the talk is given as this one. Okay. And then we have also another extension of R over here. Okay. And then we have center. Okay, we have a center of the mass, okay? 
where we call this as the center of gravity okay and then we also have the downwards okay uh downwards uh, force which is the weight okay so the top over here okay is t equals to r times uh, w okay so what we have over here is that over here we have the net gravitational top about zero uh, about origin on the center of object is the same as if all the weight acted at the cg okay so that's the meaning okay when we have okay let's say we are going to okay, let's say i have uh, an object over here okay let's say over here if you want to know that which uh, you have a center of gravity okay so actually if you can make the object okay holes without going down or going up then that is center of gravity due to that okay we have all centered all the mass okay at the center of gravity okay so mean that the force is in the equilibrium okay and at the same time we have the top also is zero okay so that's how you define the center of gravity so center of gravity exists when you have the object okay, in the equilibrium okay we have our lovely KLCC tower all right so the acceleration due to the gravity at the bottom okay of this KLCC tower is only 0 0.014 greater than at the top okay so the center of gravity of the towers is only about two centimeter below the center of the mass okay so that's why it is important all right it is important when the engineers okay, who want to design uh, or want to construct and uh, and a building so this actually the equilibrium of the the physics of the equilibrium is important in order to ensure that the building will last for very long time okay because you need to consider the vibration that involved right and then whether the elasticity okay that involved in the building material and also the deformation okay of the material this is because you have uh, let's say maybe you can have a earthquake okay so that must be designed okay so the building must be designed to cater that problem so because if you have excessive vibration of course the building will collapse okay and also for the tall very tall building so you need to make sure that it won't collapse okay correct because when a tall building then uh, when it is a tall building then you don't have uh, you have very small width with the tiny width so your center of gravity will be at a uh, very uh, I mean it is at a very long height Okay, because it will be at the center of that uh, building right so that's why in the design of KLCC so you see that the structure is make it more tinier at the top okay so you don't see that uh, building okay you don't see that a uh, building that have 
a bigger structure at the top okay because the below uh, material cannot support okay, the weight at the top so it must be faster that okay the weight at the top okay if you want to make it very tall okay so you must consider that making it uh, I mean the dimension of the tower should be very large very uh, very big at the bottom so you can make a very very tall tower okay but if you want to have different design that is okay but as long as as I, I show to you on the first slide like this one okay you have an arc okay you have an arc where it is connected with another side of the uh, of the leg okay of that building so it can also sustain okay it can also sustain the building material so it won't collapse okay that's much more on the design of the building okay um, so still on the center of gravity so let's have a look at this mark okay if you suspend a mark okay from any point okay so we have okay we can make a, a line extending down from the point of the suspension passes through the center of gravity okay and then if we suspend okay so we mirror it so we mirror the the holding of the glass so it will have another point so we can draw okay also on the vertical line so how do you know the center of gravity so the center of gravity at the cross okay at the cross intersection of the line that you draw Okay, so that's the center of gravity. Okay, so we look at the car. Alright, if we have an elevated angle of the road. Okay. So we must have, okay. So we must have the center of gravity okay center of gravity somewhere near to a little bit to the okay in the original car so we have the center of gravity at the center of the car okay so that's including the weight okay so if you are inside the car like in the elevated angle so in order to sustain the weight of the car so all of the people okay most of the people should be over here okay in order to sustain the weight okay so the weight over here will be lesser and then the weight over here will be much bigger so you have the weight over here at the center you so you have the center of gravity at the center of the car all right so if it is like that then the center of gravity maintaining maintaining the car in the equilibrium okay so the the weight must be distributed okay among this area okay among this area okay so we look again if it is much more elevated okay so the angle is much bigger now the object is not in the equilibrium okay the car might okay rotates or fall down right so that's why uh, when you see the in, in the spots all right we have this car so 
you actually seeing uh, that the driver okay most of the time should be in this side okay should be in this side if he's going to okay to have an elevated angle of that car to be uh okay, sustain its equilibrium okay but if he is over here so of course the car will rotate it down okay okay similarly also for the the truck over here okay so what you can see that the truck okay, and the car so it is having the different center of gravity okay it is having the different center of gravity so as you can see over here the center of gravity of the truck okay it is much higher okay much higher compared to the car right so actually it depends on the shape of the object okay so you have a rectangle object and this one you have that rectangular shape is not uh i mean it is much taller than this so that's why the center of gravity will be much higher so how you can draw if you see okay, this object like that okay compare to this one how do you compare the center of gravity of the object so draw the line okay okay so like that so that's the center of gravity so you can compare with this one okay and that one so that's the center of gravity so that's why the taller object having much more uh, taller center of gravity all right uh okay so that's the concept for the equilibrium okay and then when we have the problem solving okay so that's we we'll look at this example okay, to solve a certain problem. In example 11.1, we're going to consider a uniform plank of length 6 meters and mass 90 kilograms that rests on two sawhorses as shown in this diagram. The sawhorses the saw horses are separated, separated by distance of 1.5 meters. meters. And the plank, the plank is positioned is just just the plank is positioned such that its center of mass lies directly between them. This example poses the question that if a person stands on one end of this plank, what's the maximum mass that this person can have before the system begins to tip? Obviously, at that maximum mass, the plank's force between the plank and the leftmost sawhorse goes to zero, so the entire system must be balanced on this point. In that case, the center of mass of the system must be at this point. So this problem boils down to calculating the position of the center of mass. To do that, we're going to take the positive x direction to be the right, and we're going to choose our origin at the center of mass of the plank. We'll call x of p the center of mass position of the plank, x of t the position of the person, and x of s the position of our balance point, which is the rightmost salt bars. Now we can go ahead in this coordinate system and calculate the center of mass of the system. It's going to be the mass of the plank times the position of its center of mass, which is at the origin, and the mass of the person, which is what we're looking for, times his position, which is L over 2 in this coordinate system. So here's an expression for our center of mass. We like to be to set that equal to this position of the rightmost sawhorse. Doing that, we can now solve for M shown here and we get 30 kilograms of course we didn't have to choose 
Okay, so over here, all right, you look that you need to know what is the maximum mass okay, of this guy, all right? Okay, if you want to plan, okay, still remain at rest, okay, even though he's at the tip, okay, he's at the tip of this plan. Okay, so to solve that, so we need first to find out what is the uh, location of the center of the gravity. Okay, so that's why we need to calculate the center of gravity. Okay, so okay, over here, M, so M is the mass, okay, the mass of this plank. Okay, and then times the, okay, so you have the origin, so origin is zero, plus mass of this person, okay, times the length, okay, from uh, at this location, so it is uh, L half divided by half, because this is all of this are L, and then divide by half, and divide with M plus M, okay. All right, so you have okay m okay ml over two times m big m plus small m okay and then we need to find this mass of the person to find that okay the mass of the person so we need to reach this equation okay so we make this equals to because we have that tip okay so we know that the distance between this uh, okay we have this support all right the distance between these two support is 1.5 meter all right so this is the center of the mass okay of this plank will be equal to the center of the mass of this distance, all right? So it is d over 2, okay, it is d over 2. So once you equate that, so you know that what is your d, and also you know that what is your l, okay? And then you also know what is your m, okay? So once you have that, so Actually, you can rearrange and then expand this equation and then bring m to there and then you need to find out what is your this small m okay and it turns out to be 30 kilogram okay so it is only a child that can okay uh, that can uh step on this plank okay if it is an adult step like you, okay, or like me, okay, then the plank, okay, won't sustain it equilibrium, okay, so it will, okay, it will fall over. All right, so that's how you define, okay, so mean that the problem here, you need to define, okay, two set of center of gravity, okay, so for this small one, okay, over here, okay, and another one for the big one. Right, for the big one, so you need to consider the mass of the person and also the mass of the plank. Okay, so that's how you calculate the center of gravity and then solve this problem. Okay, all right, so that's about the equilibrium and center of gravity. Okay, so we also need to know what is strain, stress, and elastic moduli, or you learned before, elastic modulus, all right? So we have three types of stress, okay? For example, we have a guitar string under tensile stress, okay? The diver, okay, under bulk stress, okay? Because due to water pressure, and then we have a ribbon and then shear stress. Okay. 
So we mentioned there are three different types of stress over here. We have the tensile stress, the bulk stress, and also shear stress. Okay, being deformed and the ribbon is being deformed and eventually cut okay, by force exerted by the scissor. Okay. Okay, so let's try to pinch uh, our nose. So if you pinch our nose, so the force per area that you apply on your nose is called, so this is called the stress. So you apply the stress. Okay, you feel that it is, uh, what we call that, you feel the pressure. Okay, you feel the pressure on the skin of your nose. Okay, so that's called the stress. Okay, the fractional change in the size of your nose. Okay, so your nose is flexible, right? So your nose is flexible. So, the, I mean, your nose will change, all right? You will, if you pinch your nose, then you will be manchung, lah, all right? You will be manchung, okay? So, if you pinch, then you saw that your nose will be manchung. So when it's manchung, so that's called the strain. Okay, that's called the strain on them because the shape can deform, right? And then the deformation is elastic. Okay? okay because our nose is like a spring, right? It's like a spring. So it will form back, okay, to the initial position, right? It's initial shape. Okay, so it is elastic. So that's the difference between stress and strain. Okay, so we look at another object over here. Okay, another, uh, one object is in tension, then the net force on the object is zero, but the object deforms. Okay, as you can see, so if the object is elastic so you can apply the force okay apply the force but the object deforms okay the tensile stress produce the tensile strain okay so we have the concept of stress and strain together okay so when we have a stress we also have a strain Okay, so calculate the stress, okay. Stress is the total force, all right. Force that we apply. So this force divide with the area, okay. With the area that we apply the force. Okay, so this is the area. Okay, remember that it is an area. It is not the uh, volume, all right. It is the area. To calculate the strain, Okay, we need to know how much the object has deformed. Okay, how much the object has deformed. So over here, so if it is deformed, this uh, over that area, so we need to define what is the delta of the change, all right? It's the delta of the change of the area, divide with the original line, okay? So that's the stand side strain. Okay, so if the object, okay, uh, having a large strain, meaning that it is very elastic, okay, it is very elastic, okay, because when you stretch it, when you stretch it, okay, actually you can stretch it much more uh, longer than the its initial position, then it is the object, it is very elastic. So it's like a rubber band. Okay. So it is like a rubber band. But uh, let's say if you have just a cable, okay, you can stretch it a little bit and then it goes back to its original position. Then that object is not much elastic. Okay. It's not much elastic. Okay, so that's the concept of stress and strain. And 
Another one, we have the concept of uh, Young's modulus. Okay, so we have uh, the Young modulus is calculated by comparing the stress and strain. Okay, so tensile stress divided with the tensile strain. So we have the Young's modulus. Okay. So that's the how you calculate the Young's modulus. And then we also have the compressive stress and strain. Okay. So before this, you um, have the tensile. Okay. So tensile, you pull. Okay, you pull the object okay but here if you compress okay, if you compress the object so we have the compressive stress uh, stress and strain okay it is similar way to calculate the stress and also strain okay you see using the area okay and for the strain we see that how much the object is compressed okay how much the object is compressed so like example over here is like a spring okay if you compress a spring and then it will deform back okay it deform back to its original position okay as long as uh, the deformation okay is uh, not breaking the object okay what is important over here okay what is important over here you need to know that your delta L right now cannot be much bigger than your original length. Okay. So mean that your compressive strain over here, the value is uh, cannot be okay, cannot be more than one. Or right? cannot be more than one. But for the tensile strain. The value can be more than one okay because whatever you compress is only you can compress at to the maximum level of the very minimum original line okay so very minimum of the original line that's why the compressive strain okay cannot have the value of more than one Okay, so that's the difference between compressive stress and strain and that's a stress and strain. Okay, we have uh, also the compression and tension. Okay, so we look uh, at the beam over there. Okay, you can see that Okay, the beam center line is neither tension or compression. Okay, the top of the beam is under compression because it is compressed. Okay, but the bottom of the beam is under tension. Okay, so because it is okay, deformed. Okay, it is deformed, so it is under tension. So that's the difference between compression and tension. Okay. So as a tension, mean that the length, the length of the object, okay, is much larger than the when we compress. Okay, when we compress, so originally it should be over there. Okay, as I can draw the line. Okay, so when it compress, then the length will be smaller, right? So the length will be smaller, and then for under tension, the length will be much bigger. Okay, so that's the difference. We also have the concept of bulk stress and strain. Okay. So in the bulk stress and strain, so we consider that volume, all right? 
So before this, we only consider the area. Okay. Now we consider the volume. Okay. So for the bulk stress, we calculate the pressure. Okay. We calculate the pressure. Okay. So we define that the object as a pressure equals to force over area. Okay. So we consider the amount of force applied. Okay. And then divide with that. Uh, with the area okay so that's the pressure okay to calculate the bulk modulus right the bulk modulus so the bulk modulus is equals to the delta p the change of pressure okay the change of pressure divide with the change of volume over the initial volume okay so that's the bulk modulus all right so you can look uh, for example okay you can look for example over there so i won't go through with the example and then okay so this is example of the box stress on the angular page okay so you can read that as well okay what's next is Okay, I want to introduce you the concept of shear stress and strain. Okay, so we also have the shear modulus. So you have the now you have three modulus. Okay, one is Young modulus, second is bulk modulus, and so the third one we have the shear modulus. Okay, so shear modulus is the shear stress divided by shear strain. Okay, so it is still given. Uh, so how you calculate that is force that you apply divided with the area. Okay, and then times h, which is the height. Okay, which is the height. I mean that if you have the initial state of the object, and then you drop it. Okay, you drop it. Okay, then you have the shear model because the object will deform after you drop. Okay, let's say you drop a box. Okay, so when you drop a box, then you will go to the left and also to the right. Okay, so you need to consider the what we have. Okay, the height of the object. Okay, the initial of the object and also times the x x is how much the object has deformed okay like this one or also this one okay that's also the similar x okay so that's the shear modulus okay so i hope that you already can differentiate how you can calculate the young modulus the bulk modulus and also the shear modulus Okay, so this is the difference between different materials for young modulus, part modulus, and shear modulus. Okay, so all right, so this is uh, for different material. So you can compare that. So among of this object, so which must, uh, which object that has have the highest young modulus is the steel. Okay, and then for part modulus, it is the steel and iron. Okay, and also for the shear modulus, it is okay the nickel. Okay, having the most. Okay, sorry, the nickel. So among this one, uh, sorry, the young modulus, we have the iron. Iron and also nickel as the biggest young modulus. And for the bulk modulus, we have the nickel as the biggest bulk modulus. And for the last one, also nickel. Okay. So nickel is very elastic according to this material. Okay. Okay, so we're going to introduce also what is the compressibility. 
So compressibility is the reciprocal of the bulk modulus. Okay, mean that one over bulk modulus. That is compressibility. Okay, so that's how you calculate the compressibility. Okay, so this is the object's uh, compressibility. So you can calculate that. Right, so this is given over here. And also we have the elasticity and plasticity. Okay. Okay, so for elasticity and plasticity, we use the Hooke's law. Okay, we use the Hooke's law. Okay. So we want to know the proportionality of stress and strain in elastic deformation. Okay. So it has the limited range of validity. Okay. So usually, uh, we call this as the hysteresis loop. Okay, this is the hysteresis loop. So the object, okay, having the stress and strain. Okay. So when we stretch the object, so it will be on this top line. Okay, when we decrease the uh, the object okay when we release the stretch on the object it will go back like that okay so that's the difference between stress and strain okay between stress and strain uh when you stretch and unstretch the object okay so this is diagram for the ductile metal, okay, such as copper or soft iron under tension. Okay. So when we don't have so much strain, okay, so remember that the strain is the change of the line of the object. Okay. It still can sustain. Okay, it still can sustain. Okay. Until that if you put so much if you put so much strain on that it won't be able to back to its original shape okay it won't be back at the original shape so this is what happened over here after this point okay, after b okay but if it is uh, okay if it is up to this point, up to A, okay, and then maybe just before B, it will still can back to the original shape, okay. But if it goes to up to B to C, so you see that, right? See that that uh, that object will not be beautiful anymore because it is already deform okay until if you much put your apply much more strain on that it will break okay it will break okay that's why we call this as a plastic deformation as you see that you have the plastic bag okay you have your plastic bag when you stretch it okay it won't go back it won't go back to its uh, original uh, shape okay because for the plastic when you stretch it okay when you apply the string it won't go back to uh original shape so that's why we call that as a plastic deformation until if you pull it if you pull that plastic back okay, if you pull that plastic with so much strain okay then of course it will break okay so up to D. So this is what we call that when the object breaks for that, that's the fracture point. Okay. So that's the relationship between elasticity and plasticity. Okay. So over here, we call that this is plasticity. And then over here, it is elasticity. So this is elasticity and this is plasticity. Alright, so lastly, 
So this is the breaking stress for some material, right? So this is what we need to apply, okay? The uh, the stress okay, or the pressure that we need to apply in order to break, okay? To break this object, okay? So it has different values of that. All right, so that's it for today. Okay, we finish uh, chapter 11. Okay, so any questions so far? I think uh, today is, uh, the topic is much more direct, okay? So, uh, it's not hard. Uh, I will show you some of the problem, okay, later. Then you can look at that, all right? And solve that for your practice, okay? All right, so before we leave, so let's turn on your camera. To take uh, the attendance for today. Right. Okay, I'm going to count from 10. Uh, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 2, 1. Okay, give me one more shot. All right, thank you. Okay, have a nice day. Okay, Assalamualaikum and bye-bye. Okay. Assalamualaikum, thank you. 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 Thank you.